morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome each of you to our worship service this morning. Another beautiful Lord's Day morning to worship the Lord. Let's start with a word of prayer. Father, we come to you. God, we thank you that you are a Father, our God and our King. And I just pray, Lord, that as we worship you this morning, you would be glorified. And I just pray that your Spirit would be here among us, be with each person who has part. And uh, I just pray that as we leave here, that we would be filled with a desire to, to honor you in everything we do. Just be here and guide us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right, uh, we'll ask for three songs, and then Trent will have devotions. Good morning. In the hymns of the church, number one. Come, O thou God of grace, number one. Eighty-five. Let's stand. Sing this. One. Number eighty-five. Great God, indulge my claim.
162. God moves in a mysterious way. This was suggested in our Sunday school quarterly for the lessons, I thought. Let's see. Number 162. Say good morning. Welcome you all to Sunday school hour this morning. To you turn your Bibles to Psalm 79. If any of you looked at the lesson this morning, I hope you did. Um, the root of the lesson is on sin. I want to ask you this morning, how do you stand before God this morning? Are you sinless? Are you living for Him? Or are you trying to play the rowboat game? Let's read Psalm 79, the whole psalm, and we'll have some comments. Verse 1, O God, the heathen are coming to Thine inherit inheritance. Thy holy temple have they defiled. They have laid Jerusalem on heaps. The dead bodies of the servants have they given to be meat unto the fowls of the heavens, the flesh of thy saints and unto the beasts of the earth. Their blood have they shed like water round about Jerusalem, and there was none to bury them. We are become a reproach to our neighbors, a scorn and discerner to them that are round about us. How long, Lord, wilt thou be angry forever? Shall thy jealousy burn like fire? Pour out thy wrath upon the heaven that have not known thee, and upon the king kingdoms that have not called upon thy name. For they have devoured Jacob and laid waste his dwelling place. O remember not against us former iniquities. Let thy tender mercies speedily prevent us, for we are brought very low. Help us, O God, of our salvation, for the glory of thy name, and deliver us and purge away our sins, 
for my name's sake. Wherefore shall the heathen say, Where is their God? Let him be known unto him. Um, sorry. Let him be known among the heathen, the heathen in our sight by the revenging of the blood of the servants which is shed. Let, him, let the signing of the prisoner come before thee according to the greatness of the power. Preserve thou those that are appointed to die. And render unto our neighbors sevenfold into their bosom the reproach wherewith they have reproached thee, O Lord. So we, thy people and sheep of the pasture, will give thee thanks forever. We shall show forth the praise of all generations. This psalm here is kind of like, I uh, thought it was a good replica of the, the Sunday school lesson this morning, but it seems like the psalmist here was a little later than the lesson this morning. He was crying to God when his people were getting, when God was in his action of punishment. Too often in life we want to call out when it's too late or when the rubber hits the road. We want to, we want to play our play our games. We want to live in sin because sin is so addictive in some areas. My brother-in-law messaged me the other morning. He wondered if I knew a young boy out there at their church. 24 years old. My brother-in-law is a minister. He said that he, they tried all they could to get him to make things right in life, and he comes so close, so close. But he kept, he kept, he loved speed. And the other week he bought a motorcycle. Wednesday night he hit a tree at 70 mile an hour head on. He dead. And he said, Why? He said, there's a message to preach this morning. He said, I sure hope he, he uh, made things right when he seen the tree. But he said, his buddy said he was all about trying to get around him. And the week before, he had told him, he said, he wants to turn his life around. God will, God will punish sin. He will. How long do you want to play with it? So often in life, we want to pay our way through. It doesn't work. We want to... To, uh, we think our good works will get us there, and it won't. I just think about myself. How often do we want to be extra busy? How often do we want to make sure we're over, overworking ourselves because there's a little sin we don't want God to prick on, but being busy will make us feel better. Sometimes in life, too, we feel that our little sin, our little corner in us is... God's going to bend his, his law to, um, to accept our, our sin. But God's law stands firm. He's not going to move for you. You know where you have to meet up with God to, to be faithful. The message, the first message that uh, Travis preached was something that I needed very strongly. There's so many times in life we... We totally forget about taking time for God. We, we don't even, we don't want to sacrifice us making a buck to worship God. And I was challenged in that message. Two, to two days prior, there was a group of us men standing around, going to start a chopping job. The man prayed in that prayer. He said, we know we're getting in a busy season, but he said, let these men know that God is in control and that they, and God is the center of their lives. And let's just take time to glorify Him. And that touched me. Because I knew that, that there's too many times I don't do that. Do you do that? Are you willing to let God take time for God? But on the bright side of it is, if we do do what God says and we, and we do worship Him and follow Him, we can very happily read verse 13. And I'll read that in closing this morning. It's a very encouraging verse, as if you're a true believer. It says, So we, thy people, and sheep of thy pasture, will give thee thanks forever. We will show forth thy praise to all generations. Are you showing God to the people this morning? Or are you trying to stumble through and try to think that God's going to let your sin... Um, 
work because it will not. You have to become, God looks for holiness. God looks for total repentance, total, total belief in Him. This time let's come to word and let's kneel for prayer. Lord, we come before this morning. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to gather like this, Lord. We ask that you would, you would um, give us a good day. Thank you for your word that we could study. Be with the Sunday school teachers this morning that we might, they might glean something from the, your word, that we might remain faithful to you and live for you in this world we live in. The devil is so busy, Lord. We ask that you would just continue to strengthen us and that we might always live for you, be a shining light for you. Just go with Saul and make us a blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Trent, for those reminders. May we choose to deal with the sin in our life and, and follow and follow Christ so we can reap those, those fruits. All right, time for Sunday school. Youth and intermediate can be dismissed. Juniors, primary, <laughs> and preschool. And uh, for the adults, um, we have a men's class up here in the front. We have a men's class in the basement. We also have a uh, women's class in the back in the auditorium here, as well as one through this door in the front. So you're welcome to, visitors welcome to join whichever class you would like. Adults can be dismissed as well. Morning in lesson four, uh, God leads Habakkuk to trust. First of all, we'll get it out of the way. You can say his name Habakkuk or Habakkuk. So whichever way you say it is fine. It's going to be pronounced either way. So don't want to have that as our distraction. Um, the introduction here, Judah was living in wickedness and God foretold, foretold through Habakkuk that they would be punished by the Chaldeans, an even more wicked na 
nation. In all of this, Habakkuk clung to faith in God and the promise that righteousness will prevail. The focus is to recognize that God will punish sin and will bless those who have faith and trust and who trust in him. The lesson really jumps around. We cover three chapters in one lesson and it like leaves a lot out, but I don't know, I don't want to take all the time to read all three chapters, so otherwise we'd be just reading the Bible so we're not discussing it very much. But a little uh, introduction to that, a little summary of all the different chapters is um, in chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, Habakkuk questions, how long will you not judge sinful Judah? And then 5 through 11, God answered, I will send the Chaldeans to judge them. Then chapter 1, 12 through 2, chapter 2, verse 1, Habakkuk's response, but God, they are more wicked than Judah. In chapter 2, 2 through 20, God replies, write the vision. Then chapter 2, Four, it will happen, I will judge them too. And five through twenty, five woes on the Chaldeans. And chapter three, one through seventeen is Habakkuk's prayer for the song. Verse one and two, I heard, Lord, revive your work, do great things again in wrath, remember mercy. And verses three through fifteen, a description of God. And sixteen, trembling at the coming judgment, and seventeen through nineteen, his faith response, I will trust no matter what. That's a little summary of the three chapters. So the first chapter is pretty much about his burden. The second one's his vision, and the third one is his song. So I guess you remember that as we read this. You think that way. We'll start with Richard and we'll go around. Faith tested. The burden which is acted the prophet we see. O Lord, how long shall I cry, and thou wilt not hear? Even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not save. Why dost thou show me iniquities and cause me to behold grievance? For spoil and violence are before me, and there, and there are that rise, raise up striking attention. The word of law is slack, and judgment doth never go forth. The wicked doth compass about the righteous, therefore wrong judgment proceed. Behold ye among the heathen, and regard, and wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your days which you will not believe, though it be told you. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One, we should not, not die, O Lord, thou hast ordered them to church me, the mighty God, thou hast established them for great Thou art of pure eyes, then, to behold evil, and canst not work on iniquity. Wherefore, lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and hold thy tongue when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he. Faith and trust. I will stand upon my watch, and set me upon the tower, and will watch to see what he will say unto me, and what I shall answer when I am reproved. And the Lord answered me, and said, Write the vision, and make it plain upon tables, that he may run that he may run that readeth it. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Faith triumphant. O Lord, I have heard thy speech, and was prayed. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years make known. In wrath remember mercy. Mount Perrin, who made the Lord from the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. Thou art his force for the salvation of thy people, even for salvation with thy Lord. Thou movest the head out of the house of the Lord by discovering the foundation of the earth. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall the fruit be in the vines and labor. The labor of the all of the and the fields shall yield no fruit. shall be cut off, and the fruit of the shall be buried in the stalls. The Lord goes the Lord God is my strength, and He will make my feet like hinds' feet, and He will make me to walk upon mine high places. So in verse 1 there, it says, The burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. 
what was his burden? Um, in what ways could the balance of the be out? Um, he was decrying the lack of justice. The wicked are prospering, and God doesn't do anything about it. So is that prevalent in our day and age? I don't know, I can only speak for myself, but I've felt that. I thought the chapter very much fits for 2024. <laughs> but I was challenged. Um, how often do we have a burden for the wicked, or do we wish judgment on them? my human side, when I see injustice, I guess it's pretty easy for me to flood up and wish God would judge them and, you know, something would happen to them. So here, Habakkuk was, he had a burden for the people. He, he wanted them to be saved. Anyone have any thoughts or questions in the first section there? see their wrongdoings without, you know, I'm, there's a, we have a sense of right or wrong, but we have to be a witness to those people. The word for burden could also be translated to oracle. But the idea of a burden or a heavy weight comes, I think, from the significance of the message. Mm -hmm. It's not something to be taken lightly. And that's how burden was used a lot in the Old Testament was as a heavy weight. I think all of us are born with an innate desire to see justice done. And when we see people seemingly get away with wicked deeds, it's we tend to struggle with God, why do you allow them to go on? And yet, what so often happens, we desire justice for the wrongdoers and mercy for ourselves. We can't do that. What's, what's soft for the goose is soft for the gander. What I want for me needs a plaque of them. <laughs> it's just been a challenge for me. Um, yes. Justice is necessary, but so is mercy. <laughs> yeah. That kind of goes into another question I have. Why does God allow wrong to be? How much time do you have? <laughs> Fire away. Why does God allow wrong to be? Is that what you asked? Let me see. For the time being. Okay, there you qualified it. <laughs> Does it <laughs> actually allow wrong? Absolutely, you know. You know, he don't he tolerates it. <laughs> Say so that again. He tolerates it. So we're starting to play on words. I know. He allows it. God is allowing Putin to destroy millions of dollars of property and thousands of lives. No. Whether you say allows it or tolerates it, I mean, kind of saying the same thing. Can you see the beauty of us obeying him so much higher? 
And what he sees the sin that we're in when we turn to him and actually walk the way he wants us to walk is beautiful to him. And so whatever way, whether he tolerates or whatever, um, yeah, when we turn our lives over to him is where he sees so much more greatness than if if he never allowed us to sin, then it would be the same. If, if you had something that's always perfect, you want and uh, see how important it is to you when, yeah, if it's always working perfectly, but when it breaks down or whatever, you see how much you benefited from it working perfectly. The answer for Joseph was, here's who I am. The answer for Asaph was, here's who I am. The answer for Job was, here's who I am. The answer for Habakkuk was, here's who I am. The answer for us is, here's who I am. <laughs> Thank you. I didn't want to be the only one talking. <laughs> And that, we get to that later in the lesson where the backpack realized that and he acknowledged that God's sovereignty. Do you think the backpack had family members who were caught up in wrong things? I agree that the burden for to look out into the world and see what's happening. The bothers me more this morning is when it's creeping into our families. And then we justify why our families are doing what they're doing. What bothers me is when we can't call sin, sin, when it's your own brother and your own sister. And when father and mother have a hard time denying their children the pleasures of the family because of sin. Are we going to stand for right and wrong in today's day and age, or are we going to justify our families going out into the world and yet accepting them as a righteous person. I realize it's hard to do and it tears families apart. If as a son I choose to leave the church and go live differently than what I was taught and what I know, and I believe there's consequences, I believe that I am no longer awarded the pleasures of my family. But yet so many times we as churchgoers justify our own families and look out into the world. Why is it? Where is our true burden? Our families in the world become all one and it becomes one big burden. But I think that God gives us a clear direction to look very close in the mirror among us to realize that sometimes you have to cut ties with family in order to save a soul. Are we willing to actually do that? It's just a challenge for myself. Mm -hmm. I want to build who it was that's preaching here made a profound statement. He said, when we take those actions Roger was talking about, we make so they're not going to come back to. That really stuck stuck with me. Is that done? I'm not sure. He said, when you follow your family because you aren't willing to cut ties, you're making so they're not going to return to. The prodigal son who never went back to his father. His father would follow his son. You're saying in the context that mom and dad follow the wayward child. The wayward child yeah. has not to return to. Or the child followed the parents. Or the child followed the parents. I've seen that happen too. His family is more important than that. Along with those thoughts, we do well to be careful with our hands. 
Yes. You're right. We don't follow them. We don't excuse them. And yet, what is the drawing power of the gospel? It's love. Mm -hmm. If that separation is made in love, there's still a hope, there's still a drawing power to bring them back. If that relationship, if that cutting of ties is harsh and condemning, without hope for redemption, forget it. They're not, they're never coming back. <laughs> love is the, love is the, love is the man. And if our family members, we don't need to condone their actions. But we better make sure that our reaction is rooted in love. Mm -hmm. What motivated the prodigal son to return? Who his father was. And it was said that his father <coughs> saw not just a bone, not just a baby. His father saw him far off. Watching. His father was waiting. His father instantly recognized him. Can you see that that's not worth it? And reached out to him. In a way that was considered most shameful in that culture. Guess we ran that rabbit down. Somewhat, so. It was all good. It was very good. I'm still back here in verse two. How, how often do we feel like a back up there and cry and cry and cry and cry and just feel like God's not hearing us? He hears us. He's just waiting for his time. How often are we still enough to listen to God to listen and hear what he has to say? So, in verse 2, we're there, you know, it kind of seems like Habakkuk is questioning God. I don't know, I, I mean, I'm not going to go down the whole road, it's okay to question God, because I think we all know, like, it depends what our motives are. It's not like he was questioning God's sovereignty and what God was doing, he was just like, why, why are you allowing this to happen? Something like that, and I just want to point out, like, Habakkuk didn't go to the other men in society and asked him. He went to the true source, and we need to remember that too. When we're looking for answers, where do we go first? Do we go to the people we know are going to give us the answers that we want to hear, or do we turn to God's Word and um, study it? A lot of times we go to other people because we're lazy. We don't want to dig for what. Or maybe we're a little scared too for what God's Word has to say. But he went to the true source. Two different words for cry in that verse. The first one is less intense than the second. How long shall I cry, even cry out? Sometimes the confusion or the burden or the pressure or the uh, soberness of the situation needs to become more acute. So we are honed in on the answer, so we focus more closely when the answer does come. As far as questioning God, it, was, it seems more of a confusion or a uh, lack of understanding so far than, a, than an unbelief or a doubt. Because he said that in chapter 2, verse 1, I'll watch to see what he will say to me, what I shall answer when I am reproved or corrected. So Habakkuk realized that I must not be viewing this correctly. I must not understand this right. I, I need further clarification. It reminds me of the difference between Zacharias asking, how can this be? And Mary asking, how shall this be? Yeah, I agree. It was more out of confusion than a real question. In verse 12 there, Art thou not from everlasting? Why did Habakkuk ask that? Yeah. 
something we already know, but to hear ourselves say it can reconfirms it in our mind. And I think that's what he was doing. He was I think it still shows to his state of confusion. But he, he was like, okay, God, you are unchanging. I, I acknowledge your sovereignty. He reconfirmed it in his mind. Let's go on to the second section. Um, what stood out to you in, the, in that section of the lesson? Verse 2 there, it says, write the vision. What was um, the vision that Habakkuk was supposed to write? It's not really in our lesson that much. But. Wasn't it a coming judgment and deportation of the, of the country? Yeah, it was a, talking about the Babylonians conquering Judah or Jerusalem in the future. Then in the last part there it says that he may that he may run that readeth it. What does what does that mean? There's like in here. There's three different ways, at least, that you can do it. It's like <laughs> interesting to see how people understand. It. Wouldn't that be the purpose of spreading the message, so that people can respond readily to it? <clears throat> Maybe it's two or three or five facets. My first thought was that if there was a a herald or a messenger relaying that to the places, they would be able to. Yeah, that was one interpretation that was like somebody that's running, it was big enough, plain enough that they could, as they're running, they could read it. I have to think like, do we make the gospel or do we make the salvation message complicated to the point that people can't understand? Or do we make it simple that everybody can understand it um, in the busyness of life even? I think in verse 3 there it talks about, I think it's a confirmation that God shows God's faithfulness um, and that God does what he says. Not always right now, maybe we want to see instant results, but sometimes we have to wait. Sometimes he says something and it'll happen in the future, but God's faithful and he will carry us through.
Any thoughts on the lesson, I mean, on verse 4 there? Just shall live by faith. Knowing the vision which is God's word to men. Live by his faith. Who's trying to follow Jesus? He's the perfect example of the one who understands God's vision and ran well. Running these things, being speedy, being moving on the word of James 1.22. In Bible times, Romans were those who needed to report messages to those who needed to hear them. We have received the message and now have a responsibility to be wrong. Wouldn't the focus kind of be on the proud person, that his soul, which is lifted up, who is he speaking of? Isn't he speaking of a proud person? Because it's not upright in him. So it looks like he's making a, uh, um, a comparison. When he says, but the just shall live by faith. So obviously, the reverse is true. The one that his soul is lifted up is not living in faith. Yeah, you're down the right road. Right. Another way you could look at it, another angle is, is something of a contrast. Asking faith in what? The proud person has faith in himself, ultimately. Mm -hmm. He can only be righteous by having faith in God. I think he was talking about the, the Chaldeans or the Babylonians. They believed in their own power, like their horsemen, their horses. The, their power was their God, and there was a lot of pride that went with that. And he is saying here that you know we can be lifted up, but the, there's judgment for those people too, like the proud. And it directly correlates with James four six about God resisting the proud, but giving grace unto the humble. Definitely um, a lesson for us too. It's come closer and. Move into the third section. Um, anyone have thoughts or questions in this section? Yeah, verse two, the end. Habakkuk is pleading with God to have mercy in the midst of wrath. How can a just God have mercy in the midst of wrath? So pride will keep us from trusting in the Lord. And in spite of his tendency, he still has where would we be without the mercy of God? <laughs> now that verse stood out to me. It's kind of an impossible question to answer for us as humans. But where would we be without God's mercy? I had to think of a father who comes to the end of himself with his <coughs> stubborn little child. You know, let's be honest, a little bit of wrath comes out. But yet, as a father, we have <coughs> mercy upon our child because our desires are to learn. And the beauty of, of God is, is that he can pour out his wrath in a merciful way. Mm -hmm. And he's perfect, so he knows just the right amount of wrath. The right amount to pour out more mercy, but it's right. It's different for you and different for me, right? Yeah. And it's so easy to get on one side or the other. It's one ditch or the other, and that's where Satan wants us. Either we're totally merciful and we let everything slide, or we're a, a ruler. In Romans 2, it says that it doesn't say it's the anger of God that leads us to repentance. Or even the holiness of God shall lead us to repentance. But the goodness of God. Even those who do not repent go into hell for eternity have received God's mercy in one sense because He has cut short their sinful life. They do not. They 
there is the, the, the opportunity to add to their guilt and to the punishment that they will receive has ceased. I guess that's true. I haven't really thought of that way. Yeah. sometimes hard to bring in, in check on what our, total, our motives are. Like, do we truly have true love for the person or do we want to just set them straight? Mm-hmm. I struggle with that sometimes. Like, yeah. How do we know that we have true love? I was listening to a message this week and the guy was saying about he, don't, he thinks that we would grasp the, the, the reality of what eternity is. We would be more loving. He said, we think so often in life, eternity, you know, give us a week, give us ten years, we'll be able to be out of it. He said, eternity is forever. He said, if you grasp that, he said, you'll love it. You'll love it. Somebody's soul. Yeah. I think it's beautiful in the last two verses of the chapter of the book of Habakkuk, even and how the peace that Habakkuk had after he gave everything to God. Like, he had these conversations with God, and he said, yeah, I will rejoice in the Lord, I will joy in the Lord, the God of my salvation. And he talks about running over the hills and the, the power that God would give him. And that's the same way for us, you know. When we give it to God, there's peace in that, even when the world around us is in turmoil. So you are dismissed. Thanks for your love.
Thank you, teachers, for taking your places. This brings an uh, end to our Sunday school hour. We'll ask for three songs and then turn the time over to the ministry. Let's continue our worship service with number 192. Jesus, thou mighty Lord. Number 192. Did I just say 162? 192. Jesus, thou mighty Lord. Father went to the number eighty eight.
number 102. Let's stand. 102. Hallelujah. Praise Jehovah. morning. I'd like to welcome everybody out today. It's a beautiful day to get together and worship. The only thing that would make it better is if we would be outside, but we're not. Um, I was really blessed this morning being here already. Um, I didn't necessarily like how our Sunday school lesson was written. 
how it skipped so much of the book, but I still was blessed. My mind was right on with Trent's devotional. Um, I don't think Trent knew it, but my wife and I read another calling hours this week that was very identical to the one Trent was talking about. There was another man, Southern Ohio, that was living a life of sin and wrecked his motorcycle as well, went off the edge of the road and died. And there's, I mean, God's a judge, but there was no hope of his salvation. And he would have had a lot of faithful people reaching out to him as well. And then I opened the Sunday school lesson this morning, was reading, and um, yeah, the message is very clear. You know, the children of Israel got away with their sin for so long. They were worshiping their children to the God of Malak. They were worshiping Baal. And Habakkuk there was asking God, why are you allowing this to happen? You know, those same patterns are still happening today, but I'm here to tell you, there will come an end to it. We don't know when, but God's not going to always sneeze at sin. So yeah, thank you, Trent, for your devotional. It went right down the same path my mind was going. Being a lot on the bright side, it's a beautiful day, and there's still hope. So let's make our calling the election sure. Okay. Um, I do not have many announcements. Brother Keith is in Farmington, Missouri this morning, having meetings yet. Continue to pray for him. Is there any announcements, testimonies, anything anybody would like to share with us? Oh, uh, the Wednesday evening reorganization results is in your bulletin. Um, the song leader is going to be Steve Hurst, Class 1, Carolyn Olmstead's Class 2, Cheryl Olmstead's in Class 3, Dorf Geyser. Thank you, Bert. Anything else? If not, the birthdays this week, we have Kayla Hornings on Monday, Keith Summers on Tuesday, Brian Steiner's Wednesday, Lee Tan, I'm not going to say your last name, but happy birthday to you as well. Um, and Sharon Miller on Saturday. All right, the offering this morning is for the ministers. I'm going to thank you, Head, for your gift. Um, the ushers can't come forward. <clears throat> All right, let's bow for a word of prayer. Dear God in heaven, I just want to thank you so much for the gift that you've given to us. Lord, as ministers here, Lord, I just want to thank you so much for each one that has been willing to give. Just bless them, Lord. Just pray a special blessing on each one. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand for the word of prayer. Let's pray for it. Dear God, we come before you once again. I just want to thank you for the willingness of Brother Bert to bring the message to us here this morning. Lord, give him wisdom, give him courage, give him strength to share what you've laid on his heart. And Lord, just bind the powers of the devil, remove distractions from among us. And Lord, just send your spirit to minister to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God the Father and our Son and His Son, Jesus Christ. Brother Willis prayed and said, Thank you for His willingness to be 
the servant this morning, he does not know if I'm willing. But it is, an, it is a privilege to be able to study the Word of God and then to share what God has impressed upon me. That last, I think it was the last song when we were sitting, that was all-inclusive. It talked about all the creation and everything praising the Lord. It started in the heavens and went through the host of the heavens and, and everything. And I thought, where does man come in? And wouldn't you know, right there at the very bottom, it was all princes, kings, men, el elderly and, and children, everyone praising the Lord. We have so much to thank the Lord for. I want to begin with the ending. Turn with me to Ephesians 4. And you can save that spot then. But verse 13 is where I want to begin. And Lord willing, we will end in Ephesians 4 again. Ephesians 4, 13. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of the faith. I underlined in the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son, unto a perfect man and the fullness of God. That is my heart, that we would measure to the stature of the fullness of Christ. We are little Christs. We are portraying Christ to people around us, to our family. It says, the measure of stature, until we measure up to what Christ would have us to be, that we are a true picture of Christ, a true picture of who Christ is. Christ is a picture of unity. It says, unity of the faith. Till we all come into the unity of the faith or in the unity of the faith, as the King James says. The unity that Christ had with his Father. Just a few quotes from Christ. He says, my Father and I are one. You have seen me, you have seen the Father. He was a perfect picture of the Father. if we measure up to the stature of the fullness of Christ, we also will reflect the Father when we come into the fullness of Christ. I do nothing of myself, but the Father has taught me. The title I came up with was Unstoppable Unity. I don't know, maybe... Our sound man can come up with a better one. I want to take a lesson from Genesis 11 concerning unity. Genesis 11, the first nine verses. One phrase in this passage and the first nine verses says, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. These were a, was a group of people, and, it, and God said, And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. As we read this account, remember that nothing is impossible for them. If they put their mind to it, they're going to do it. Unstoppable unity. Whatever they decide, whatever they imagine, whatever they design, they will accomplish. That was the word of God. Read, I'm going to read the first nine chapters of Genesis 11. This is following the generations of Noah, the introduction of where, who they were and where they settled. And then it says, and the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, 
and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick, and burn them throughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach into heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. One language, one speech. One language, one vocabulary. A little bit of word study here, and it says one. Ikat. Ikat is one. That's the Hebrew word that is used. One language, ikat language, ikat speech, united, all together, unified, unified language, unified speech. They were one. The same word one is used in Genesis 2 where it says, and, and they shall be one flesh. Concerning Adam and Eve, the same oneness is the language used here, or is the, is the word used here for, for, uh, for the language and the speech that they had. If we drill into the word language, it can mean the lip as a natural boundary. Think about a bucket or a basket. The lip is the top edge, right? It's a boundary. It's a margin. It's the... The bank of a river, it's a binding or a border, a brim, a seashore. That is what that word can mean. It also means language, safa. And interestingly, the root word is pronounced exactly the same, it's spelled different, and it means opposite. Rather than a binding or a border or bringing it together or keeping it one, it means to scrape away or to scatter, to remove, to perish or to ruin. So the root word means opposite of what this word is telling us. One language would be a natural boundary. Speech is literally just the words an answer, a command, to confer, to report. It's just talking, using the words. I liken the language as culture. Language brought parameters. Language is the, has the bonding effect on us. That is the culture. And speech is the spoken word. Language is culture, and culture is language. When we use words, I'm sorry, in culture, there are things that are unspoken that are understood. Right? It's just a given. We know. It's accepted. It's normal. Speech is different. Speech is a spoken word. Words can be misunderstood. A a speaker can say something and the listener can hear completely different than what was intended to be heard. And I was wondering, Brother Travis preached seven messages last week, and I wonder how many things he said over the pulpit that he intended in one way and we received it in another way. There was a father that asked his preschool child 
What was the lesson about in Sunday school today? And the preschool child replied, it was about a bad king that chased a bunch of kids out of the, his country. So what the Sunday school teacher did was she was talking about the children of Israel and Pharaoh chased them out of his country. Do you understand? The hearer hurt different than what the speaker was saying. The children of Israel, in her mind, was these little people were being chased out of the country. Does that make sense? So words can be misunderstood. But here we have this people, and they had a culture, and they had the spoken word. And they were one. They were united. They were one unit. And it says that they journeyed east or eastward. It's in, I don't think we know where they came from, but it says they traveled. If it, you find a translation where it says east, the footnote says it might be eastward. If the translation says eastward, it might, uh, the footnote will say, say east. It could mean either one. But culture and words gave them power. It gave them unity. And God says, and now nothing will restrain them, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Unstoppable unity. They came to this valley, and they dwelt there. This is a good life. These are the good old days. How can we preserve this, what we're experiencing? And a little side note, God had told the... God had told Noah, re, replenish, fill the earth, replenish the earth, right? And I would imagine that command was to go into all the land rather than on one pile. But they, I believe in disobedience to God's command, decided we're going to preserve what we have. This is a good thing. How can we keep what we have? How can we pass this down to our children, to our grandchildren? This good life that we're experiencing. Verse 3 and 4, extremely inward. And they said one to another, Go to, let us, think about that selfishness, let us make brick and burn them throughly. And they had brick for stone and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to now, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach into heaven, unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. They wanted to do exact, exactly opposite of what God had told them. They were afraid to be scattered. They were afraid to lose what they had. They had culture. They wanted famous achievement. Lest we be scattered and we be lost in society. Lest we lose this community. Now, I don't know what you imagine this tower to be. A city is pretty easy to imagine, right? What it would look like. But what was this tower? Was this tower a pyramid? I don't know. I, I imagine probably a pyramid because that are some of the ancient tall buildings. But it says these people had a mind to work. They were unified and they were unstoppable. <clears throat> How tall was this tower before God stopped them? I don't know. What if it was as tall as some of the Bible story books make it out to be and, and it's as high as the clouds? <clears throat> it would be pretty high. A few resources that I used to, to study concerning pyramids was a Bible dictionary, Wikipedia, and then also a history book from, from Abeka. The Great Pyramid is currently the largest one still standing. It's found in Egypt. The base of it covers 13 acres. 
and it was 482 feet high. So think with me, if the tower in the Valley of Shinar was taller than 482 feet, how big was the base? If this base is 13 acres, and 13 acres is a lot of square feet for a building. This, this pyramid has more than 2,300,000 stone blocks. It is estimated to be 5,700,000 tons. The average block that is in this Great Pyramid is two and a half ton, but some of them are as large as 60 ton. That is the one that is still standing, according to history books. Now, a 13 acre footprint is about 730, no, 753 feet square. Some of these chicken houses are 600 feet, right? Put four 600 foot chicken houses and you still don't have the, still don't have the square footage that you need to build this. This was large. So the people of this city called Babel, Babel, they had brick for stone. That was their building material. They had slime for mortar. And it appears that they baked the brick. So obviously they didn't take the brick up to in position and then bake them. It says they fired them. The slime could be petumen, which is asphalt or tar, to hold the brick together. There's a thought that they might have used self-intersecting polygram. I'm not sure if I'm using that word correctly, but it was a shape that uh, may have been used for these brick or these big stones. And this is what I imagined it to be, something similar like this, and they sit together and they fit together and they interlock, self-intersecting stones. I don't know if that's what it was or not. They had an imagination and I have an imagination as well. So maybe, maybe this was the shape of the brick that they were using. They likely didn't have concrete forms. They likely didn't have ready mix concrete trucks bringing concrete. They likely didn't have concrete pumps to get it up there. They used imagination, they used innovation, and they used engineering. Whatever they set their mind to do, they were able to do it. And now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. All out, all hands on deck. God says in verse 6, Let us go down and there confound... I'm sorry, that's verse 7. Verse 6, God comes down and he beholds what is going on. And then verse 7, Go to, let us go down and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. This people is one. They are one language. They are of one speech. They have a good culture. And what they have begun, they will complete if we don't do something. They're together on vision. They have a good community. They are unstoppable. The power of unity. Let's mix them up. Let's mingle the language. I don't know if they had scaffolding or, or what they had, but imagine with me, one man is up there. And once in a while he calls, I need more brick. And he, he gets some brick. And now God comes down and he mix, mixes the language. And the man calls, I need more brick. And the answer comes back, Was bist du Salah? Ich kann die nicht verstehen. The one down, down here says, Was ist am Salah? And the reply comes, Esto es confuso, no sé qué está pasando. And they're all confused. And I'm not sure what I said. I hope you do. 
very frustrated. And I can imagine if they were working together and this building was going well, they felt frustrated and they felt right. So imagine with me the frustration and, and the, the language barrier and they're going back and forth. The only thing that they communicated with one another was the tone of voice, right? And that probably didn't last very long. If it is, if it was in that day like it is in this day, we tend to think we are right and we're using the right language and we're at the right spot. The opposite of unity is division, but that's where division started. And there's a verse in Proverbs that says, every, every way of man is right in his own eye. And I expect that applied to them, that they were all right in their own eyes and everyone else was, was wrong. And the building stopped. I find it interesting the purpose of this city and this tower was that we be not scattered. Do you know what happened? It says they were scattered abroad upon the face of all the earth. God did scatter them exactly what they were commanded to do. In Acts, you will find the reverse of this. There was one language being spoken and everyone heard in their own language. They were commanded to go into all the, all the earth, all the world, to take the gospel with them, and they did go. The early church did exactly that. What they were preventing from the beginning is what God ended up doing with them. I believe it's true today when we communicate well things can work out when communication breaks down that is when trouble begins there's other examples in the Bible thinking about Nehemiah he had a big project in front of him and it says that he rallied the people with the testimony of the hand of God and with the king's words. Three verses, Nehemiah says, So built we the wall, and all the wall was joined together unto the half thereof. For the people had a mind to work. They were unified. They had a mind to work. They were unstoppable. But wait, so the wall was finished in the 20th and 5th day of the month, Elul, in 52 days. And it came to pass, when all our enemies heard thereof, and all the heathen that were about us saw this thing, they were much cast down in their own eyes, for they perceived that this work was wrought of our God. God was in it. They were unified. They completed the project. These verses make it sound fairly easy. They did rebuild the wall, but they also faced much opposition. First of all, there was scorn. I believe the second one I found was mockery. Even a fox will break down the wall that you're building. Next was the, a, a thread, a thread of an ambush. It caused them to work with one hand and hold a weapon in the other hand. How frustrating would that be? But they had a mind to work. They were dedicated to the task. At one point, half the men were on guard and the other half were working. But Nehemiah is a story of working together for a common cause. The power of unity in the middle of trouble, in the middle of difficulties. In fact, these workers had a common enemy. And I was wondering what would have occurred if they did not have a common enemy. Sometimes when we don't have a common enemy... We turn on each other, don't we? But the enemy was identified, and they were focused. They were not distracted with fighting each other. I believe that's one point that's important for us to know or to remember. Satan does not, 
not like unity. And he will try to destroy that unity. Identify the enemy. The enemy is not our brothers and sisters in church. The enemy is not our co-workers. The enemy is not our partner on the same mission. Let's identify the enemy. Lest we start fighting each other. Misidentifying our enemy is a disaster. It takes so many relationships and projects wrong. It occurs way too frequently. In the military, I believe they call it friendly fire. And believe me, it's not friendly. It's deadly. David and his men had great unity under one great leader. They accomplished many things. The number 400 shows up quite a few times under David's leadership. And it says that the 400 men were David's great men. They had unified vision. They had shared experiences. The word synergy came to mind. Probably most of you know what synergy means. Synergy is where the end result is greater than the sum of individual parts. Does that make sense? So an example is one draft horse can pull 8,000 pounds. Two draft horses should pull 16,000, right? If you add eight and eight, it should be 16. No, two draft horses can pull 24,000 pounds. Now put those two draft horses together when they're, when they're young and unbroken. You raise them together and you train them together. They will pull up to 32,000 pounds together. It's the unifying experience that... I'm sorry, it's the experience that brings the unifying power to them. That is what synergy is. An African, power, an African proverb says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. I think of fundraisers. I think of barn raisings. And I thought of going into details with barn raisings. I don't know how many of... This generation knows about barn raising, but those heavy beams are difficult to get into place, and it takes a lot of working together to do it. We are co laborers together in those projects. There was a house fire in our former neighborhood. One morning I went to work. It was dark yet, and I saw there was quite a bit of activity. The house had burned out, but not down. And I got, to work, I got to work and they said, yes, there was a house fire there last night. That evening when I went home from work, they had a big machine there and the house was down. The next day they had the basement dug and they had the, I believe the second or the third day they had the footer port. And by the fifth day they had the frame up and they were setting the last truss when I went home from work let's say in, in like four or five days. Working together, community is what I'm describing. There was another house fire in the town of Millersburg just a day or two before that. And I intentionally went by there this morning and it is exactly the same, it's, it, it is in the, in the same stage as it was the first morning after the fire. And it could be, it could be various things to that as far as insurance and all, all of those things. But I'm, I'm trying to get us to understand what community and what unity does. It gets things accomplished. There is nothing that they can imagine that they can't do. How does that look in our life today? Let's say the church is a training ground. You've heard me say, sunlight is a good place to be from, right? So these horses can go a lot, can do a lot more together if they're trained together. Would that be fair to say we're in a training ground, we're being trained together? We can do a lot more when we train together. 
We don't go alone. We go together. In the brotherhood, there is no place for individualism. Think about those stones that were drawn up there. One stone gets lost in the building, right? Every stone is an individual, but it gets lost in the building. We lose our identity in Christ. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. Galatians 3.28 We are raised together. We are trained together. We are one small part of a much greater mission. Being of one accord. Being of one mind. Practical things for us in the brotherhood. Being of one accord, being of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than yourself. Even this last week, I had to work through that. Do you know it's not pleasing to the flesh to get the back seat? Let each esteem other better than themselves. Self just keeps raising its ugly head. It wants to be out there. The Bible also says submit one to another. Be a good listener in the brotherhood. Humble yourself. These are direct commands from God. Extend grace. Love as you would like to be loved. Oh, it's easy to say that. But we know it's so difficult. We often turn to John 17 when we talk about unity. Jesus was praying, neither pray I for, neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. That they may be one, and we, that they also may be one in us. Us in Christ, us in God. That the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them. Here it is again. That they may be one, even as we are one. It is repeated numerous times for emphasis. I in them, thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Do you want to evangelize the world? Right there it says that the world may know. How will the world know? By our love for one another. Live in unity. Be at peace. Be at peace with your teammate. Be at peace with your brothers and sisters. Be at peace in Christ. That the world may know. Turn with me to Ephesians 4. The first 16 verses, when I read this the first time, I thought, well, we could probably just stay here, but I want to use this passage for some closing comments. And think about what I was talking about as far as the unity and the working together and the self-intersecting. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you, that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with longsuffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, e even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all, that sounds like unity, doesn't it? It does not sound like div division. Verse 7, But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Therefore he says, When he ascended up in heaven, he let captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. 
verse 11, and he gave some apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ, for whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, making increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Verse 16, for whom the whole body fitly joined together, that would be my heart, unity, fitly joined together, self-intersecting, a self-intersecting Christian, we get lost in the brotherhood. Yes, we're individual parts, yet we're a part of a bigger thing, of a much bigger thing. In fact, I believe alone we're incomplete. Alone we cannot obey all the commands of the Bible, all the commands of God, together in obedience to the Scripture. And going back to Acts 2, when God reversed what occurred at the Tower of Babel, there again God commanded us to go into all the earth, to scatter. But you know what? If we do scatter, we will not lose our identity. We take the gospel of Jesus Christ with us and we built the kingdom wherever we are. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, all fitting together in unity. No competition, but complementing each other in love. Shaped and gifted in Christ, by Christ, to fit perfectly into the body of Christ, into the brotherhood. Self-locking, almost like a chicksaw puzzle. Now I bese 1 Corinthians 1.10 Now I beseech ye, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. There are so many verses that speak into this same thing. Unity, nothing will restrain us from achieving what God gives us to do. Can we claim that same thing that God accused those people? Fitly joined together, united, achieving what God has given us to do. Colossians 1.27, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. That is my vision for us at Sunlight Chapel perfect, complete, fully mature, that we present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. It starts here in the brotherhood. It flows out into our community. It goes further into the, the whole country, into the whole world, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus wherever God leads us. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. Starting with me, first of all. Working in me mightily. Starting in me. Ongoing in me. Unity of the Spirit. Nimrod's descendants there in the valley of Shinar. They were one language. They were one speech. And they were unstoppable in the unity of that they had, in the community that they had. Just as Nimrod's descendants were unstoppable, I believe the Church of Jesus Christ is also unstoppable if we are unified. If we don't voluntarily scatter across the world, maybe God will come and take down that tower and scatter us across the world. By the way, I don't know what happened to the city and the tower. 
I don't know that history would tell us. Having the same mind, having the same vision, being unstoppable, planting, watering, cultivating, encouraging, building the church of Jesus Christ. Jesus says, I will build my church and I invite us to be a part of that. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That we give a, my heart would be that we give a clear and an accurate reflection of Christ. What will it be for us here at Sunlight? Will it be the unity of the Spirit of God, all speaking one language, all sharing one vision, all spreading the gospel wherever we go? Or will we try to build a tower, a city, a name for ourselves, and therefore God will stop us? I invite us to unite together so that we will be unstoppable building his kingdom for his glory. Shall we have a song? Thank you for that appropriate song. Thank you for being here, for watching with me one hour. So there's no service planned this evening. So be a blessing to someone as you visit or invite them in your home. I invite you to stand and we'll have a dismissal prayer.
Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. I thank you again for your great love to us and thank you for calling us unto yourself, making us one of your own. Thank you for your word to us this morning and thank you for the power of unity. Lord, I ask that you would do your work in each of our hearts so that we can lay down our life for our brother and for our sister and lay down our life for your kingdom. Lord, give us a desire to Take the gospel to all people, wherever they are, the hurting, the lost, the sick. Make us your hands and feet and ask that you would build your kingdom. Again, ask your blessing on each one that was here. Pray that uh, your word can find lodging in each of our hearts. Prepare us for glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You are dismissed. Be with